Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Piano Star Masterclass, brought to you by Piano League. I am your host, Brian Lin, a professional pianist and a piano teacher. Ever since I graduated from Juilliard a few years ago, making piano education accessible to everybody has been one of my main goals. And that's why I created the series, the Piano Star Masterclass, a 30-minute star talk interview with a guest teacher, followed by an hour of real-time, one-on-one virtual piano lessons taught by the uh, the guest teacher. During the math class, you can ask us any questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. The Piano Star Master Class features piano experts coming from a big variety of backgrounds, giving you a ton of different, fresh perspectives. They range from experienced piano pedagogue, professional concert pianists, to conservatory professors. And of course, you or your students can also sign up to be a performer for these master classes and get a chance to perform for a live audience. To sign up, simply go to thepianoleague.com slash masterclass. Now, I'd like to introduce our guest teacher today. Currently serving on the faculty of the Curtis Institute of Music as a collaborative pianist, Michelle Ken is also music director of the historic First Baptist Church of Philadelphia. She has performed in solo and chamber recitals throughout the US, Europe, China, and South Korea. She is a frequent soloist with many major orchestras, including the New Jersey Symphony, North Carolina Symphony, Memphis Symphony, Knoxville Symphony. Michelle is also a leader in creating opportunities for music education in her community. Most recently, Michelle served on the faculty of Sphinx Performance Academy during their inaugural year at the Juilliard School. So without further ado, everyone, please join me in welcoming Michelle Kent. Hi, Hi Michelle, Brian. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thank you so much great. for inviting me to be part of this series. It's I've really an been an honor of mine. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and 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 thank you so much for for uh, pr uh, providing us with your valuable time. Um, you you're doing well in this uh, quarantine. Your 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 life has been normal. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, you know, I guess. Uh, everyone's kind of experiencing this in different ways. Um, to be honest, I'm very grateful um, because I did lose, you know, as I'm sure you and many other musicians lost um, concert opportunities, but a lot of them are going to be able to be rescheduled at some point, which is great, um, great news. And, um, you know, and I, my work with Curtis is not going on right now, but I have a lot of private students, which I've always been a teacher um, for many years. And that is so valuable to me right now, of course. And um, just to be healthy, you know, and I think a lot of us, we worry about these materialistic things. And of course it matters what our careers are and what we wanted to be doing. But first and foremost, I'm glad that I'm healthy and plan to stay that way. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm I'm glad that we're all uh, we're both healthy as well. It's it's yes. <laughs> so important to play uh, to to stay safe these days. Um, yes, as yes. far as I understand, um, you played six different instruments when you were young. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we could just talk a little bit about that so that our audience get to know you a little bit. What were sure. the instruments and uh, how many do you still play? And <laughs> and last of all, do you think uh, playing those instruments helped you in any way? to become mm -hmm. better at piano? That's a great question. Um, six instruments. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there was, let's see if I'm right about that number. So there was piano, violin, trombone, tuba, steel drums. I played um, the handbells for a while in my, and also organ for a little while. So that's actually seven. If we oh, count wow. handbells <laughs> at any rate. <laughs> Hey, but, uh, right. I am go as an instrument, <laughs> so why not? <laughs> Being in the handbook choir, hey. So at any rate, um, yeah, so why is that the case? Why did I learn so many instruments? A lot of that is because of my father. Uh, he is a director of music. A, I say director of music because he directs so many different ensembles at a private school in Florida where I grew up um, and is still teaching there. At any rate, um, by... I'm sure you can imagine when you have a parent that is a music teacher, his or her kids are 
probably going to be involved in those music groups, right? Yes, <laughs> and yes. so that, <laughs> that was the case uh, with myself um, and my, um, well, I have three other sisters, but two other sisters were involved in these groups. And um, they also played many instruments. I won't name them all. But at any rate, so now growing up, playing all these instruments, I also sang in the choir. And, and now I'm a director, choir director at the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia, as you mentioned, um, I would say that it definitely had a huge influence on um, who I am as a musician today. Um, by having one played so many different types of instruments, you know, ranging from strings, violin to wind and trombone and such. Um, and then also violin is a treble clef instrument, trombone is a bass clef instrument, and also different tuba, of course, like we're talking about such a different range of sound. And my role in each ensemble was different, right? I often, I was in youth orchestra in high school, I was in the first violin section, then I would play the tuba in the band. So I'm, I'm going from the lowest instrument to the highest and feeling how to support a group with a different kind of sound, right? And then of course, piano, we had to play, you know, the entire range. So I think there was a lot that I was able to develop just my ear in having played so many different types. And then of course, I think when it came to um, which, you know, sight reading, and that was a lot of that, of course, I will say came from piano too, but um, being able to play with different ensembles, you know, you're constantly having to read music, you know, right, immediately, as opposed to sometimes pianists, we can be a little isolated, and we can be a little bit, you know, lazy about our sight reading, and you're in a group, you're constantly doing that. So at any rate, putting all of that together, I think it just helped make me who I am. Um, and now, what do I still play? That was your other question. <laughs> I mean, really quite honestly, um, the only instrument I really kept up to some degree would be the violin. Um, I try to pull that out in some capacity every year. I think lately I haven't played it so much. It's so hard to find the time, right? But I, I absolutely love the violin. I think um, if I, at, a, at one point, and things always go one way or the other. If I had a choice, I may have also chosen to be a professional violinist. So it was it was always between violin and piano for me. <laughs> wow, I am so I'm always so jealous of people who can't play you know multiple instruments, even even if it's just you know two or three, because um, I only play one. So <laughs> that's okay, well. that's that's that. <laughs> Right. Um, it's okay. okay as long so as you play one well, <laughs> right? Right. 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 Hopefully that's the case. <laughs> um, so um, since we only have thirty minutes, uh, I I just like to touch on our topic today. The topic today is a beginner guy to becoming a more expressive pianist. Right. So I guess I'd like to ask you, what does it mean uh, for you uh, to be? What does it mean, I guess, in general, to be a more expressive pianist? Hmm. That's a good question. I know that my topic kind of leaves, it's pretty open-ended, right? It's like, where is she going with this? So actually, before I answer that, I have a question for you, okay? All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> turning this around. So my question, Brian, is what is music to you? Like, what does music mean to you? Just what is it? What is music? Not is even that your question? You, what is music? What is it? <laughs> okay, well, if we're going by, uh, you know, just a general sense of what music is, I think I would say that it's kind of in a, a combination of sound that mm -hmm. gives people a certain feeling or emotion. So that's, okay. that's how I would define music. Okay, that's really good. Actually, I'm impressed. So I started off and I looked this up. I've actually never looked this up before because we all just sort of answered. And I think most of us would answer it in some way similar to what you said. So I was curious what Merriam Webster's dictionary said. So this is the actual definition, okay? The science or art of ordering tones or sounds in succession, in combination and in temporal relationships to produce a composition having unity and continuity. How do you feel about that? When I read that, I was just like, okay, that's not why I play music. 
<laughs> right. Sounds like, very academic. It, is, it does, right? But anyway, I the summary, right, is that it basically is an organization of sounds, as you said, or tones in a rhythmic, melodic, or harmonic manner, right? And those are the elements. So, but like I said, who wants to stop there? Who wants to say and read that and talk about music in this way and leave it at that? You touched on it very well. The other side of it, and I think the part that really matters to all of us is how it makes us feel. What is, what emotionally, what does it do for us, right? If it does nothing for us and it becomes only scientific, I think it loses its beauty, right? So at any rate, I wanted to talk a little bit about that side of it, okay? Now, to me, if you're attending, let's say an orchestra concert, um, if you wanna to go to the club and dance or something, or you're singing hymns in a church, right? All of these um, affect us in some, uh, in some particular way, right? And, and how we feel when we experience this music, it doesn't matter who you ask, it's bringing some type of good feeling that's why we immerse ourselves in it, right? And um, one thing I love to ask any, my students or really ask anyone is, what is your favorite piece of music? Like what's your favorite song or your favorite piece of music? And why is it your favorite? And the why matters. Because again, it's, it always comes down to, and usually the answer comes around, I feel this way when I hear this piece. You know, it elicits this type of response emotionally, right? But What's actually interesting is that I've been a teacher for many years now, um, started teaching when I was actually in high school even. And I even think about myself when I was a certain, of a certain age, you know, when I was younger. And when we're learning an instrument, which we're using this instrument, and it could be our voice too, our instrument, our voice is an instrument, which we use to make music, right? We very often get caught up in the technical requirements. So I go back, right, to the dictionary definition there where we talk about, okay, it's a combination of sounds, but moving past that, we start thinking about, okay, what are the technical requirements of my instrument? I've got to be able to get these rhythms right and get these notes right. And we stop there. Now, don't get me wrong. The technical requirements, of course, are important, right? Of course. For instance, if I wanted to play well, when I started to play the trombone, right? If I have no idea how to produce a sound correctly, to blow into the instrument, to create a sound, right? Then the last thing I'm think thinking about is how to be more expressive. <laughs> like in that moment, right? There's times <laughs> we have to figure out how to make our instruments work, whether it's our voice or any other instrument. And this is our foundation. It is extremely important, no doubt about it. Now. I would even compare, let's go away from music for a moment. You would think about maybe an artist. You would say, okay, they need to understand the techniques of painting or sculpting before they create their great masterpiece, right? Someone probably taught them the actual techniques. Or if we talk about a composer, forget just a performer, maybe someone like Mozart, everyone knows Mozart. He needed some kind of formal training of musical theory, counterpoint, structure, whatever, et cetera. He knew about these things before he wrote some of his great symphonies and operas and works or whatever you may call. And that being said though, is that what makes Mozart or Michelangelo or you know any other really memorable artist, is that what makes them memorable, right? Is that what we think about? The technique and theory alone? No, right? To me, it's the inspiration, the spirit, and the soul of their works that move us, right? And basically, I know I just brought up Mozart and Michelangelo, we're not all of them, right? But everyone has this, everyone. Because as human beings, we're made to be expressive and express ourselves in such a wide variety of ways. But we have to not be afraid to access this. You know, I think sometimes like there's that fear of the technical hurdles that can basically stifle our voice. You know, we get stuck in the technical requirements and then we forget the fact that we don't, we don't have to be a genius. We just have to be ourselves because we are expressive people. We're, we're also, and actually I think the quarantine has been interesting in how 
basically touches on a lot of people if they say I'm depressed about this. Well, it's not just about the worry about the virus, of course, which is part of it, but it's also because, oh, I just feel so lonely or I, I wanna connect with my friends or I wanna do, and it's about connection, right? And that's the other side, because again, as human beings, we are social creatures. That's very important to us. And music is very social, right? I mean, think about even I think right now online, it's been interesting to see um, through Facebook Live and all sorts of ways, especially if you're a musician, right? You cannot go through your newsfeed now and not see someone playing an instrument live, right? You can't, you can hardly go a couple of people's pages and then you see someone playing. And why is this? Because in, you get it, Brian, I get it. Because we need to share our music. We want to, it's in us to share it. Yes. And so all of this, this points to the fact that you don't have to be this genius. It has nothing to do with your age or even your experience that as a human being, you want to connect and you want to express yourself. So now um, the question is to me, and I guess this goes really into my topic, how can we do this as a beginner pianist? Okay, and I say that because, okay, one might say, well, first of all, a child doesn't have the same range of emotions as an adult, right? So, you know, so here's the question, is it like the depth of, emotions, okay? Well, that might be true to some extent because experience and time adds to our range of emotion too, right? I know for me, when I was 10 and how how deeply I may have thought about, you know, different emotions in a piece that I was playing, that definitely changed as I got older, as I experienced more things, right? It can, it can. Um, but here's the point. So what? <laughs> so, okay, so let's say that maybe the range is not as, as wide, right? But does that mean that the child is not experiencing emotions? That will, of course not. Of course not. It's impossible. A child comes out of the womb crying. <laughs> well, anyway, so like there's the emotions immediately there, right? No, but the idea is that, you know, a child, what? Happiness, anger, fear, love. I mean, already that's there from being born, right? And so... To me, even if you just took those basic emotions and a child sat down and played the piano and accessed those emotions as they played, it would bring life and color to, to any piece, right? It, it's totally possible. I think as teachers, we know the how important a good foundation is for our, for our students to do well in the future. And we know that, again, those technical requirements, how do you sit at the piano, you know? What's your hand position, right? All of these things, we start with this. It is important. There's no way that it's not. But we, and I, including me, will forget or brush away the importance of pushing a child to express their emotion through the music when even when they're just beginning. Think about it this way. What makes us improve at anything is practice, right? If we don't practice, freely expressing our emotions through our instruments from a young age, what makes us think that as adults, we will be comfortable doing this? If no one has pushed us to say, hey, just as much as you expressed anger at your mom for telling you to go practice when you really didn't want to practice, yeah, that was some real anger that you expressed. Trust me, I have had that when I was little. <laughs> You put a whole tantrum because you didn't want to go sit at the piano and practice. So why don't you take that anger and bring it to this really stormy piece? Because maybe you have a song that you're playing that's a little stormy. Put that into the music, right? And at any rate, we practice this. It's important that we do practice this from a young age. So at any rate, I've worked with many teenagers and young adults, right, who when asked what the music is saying, and I'll ask them that, and what the expression is beyond the notes. I had to plug my title. <laughs> and give, you know, I'll say this, and they'll Very give nice. me, yeah, I try, I, I, you know. <laughs> so when I ask them this, they give me a blank stare, okay? I know you know what I mean if you have students sometimes, you know? Oh, oh 100%. What, <laughs> what is the music saying? Crickets. 
okay? And it hasn't occurred to them to even think about this, really, truly. They're like, but I got all the notes right, didn't I? I it said forte, I did forte, okay? Um, there's a slur. Yeah, I lifted my hand at the end of that phrase, right? I did what you asked. Like, it's like all technical. But you said, well, what does the music feel like? You know, what's going on? Crickets. So at any rate, it, I, I think at this point, anything that I share with a student, especially when they're like a young adult at this point, it seems artificial because it didn't come from within their soul. You know, it's, I, it's how I feel when I heard them play. It's how I feel when I play that piece. And not to say that me sharing how I feel won't inspire them, it might, but it won't matter if they don't feel it within themselves. And so to me, once you practice thinking about what the music is trying to express, after a while, it becomes second nature. And, and it, it's exciting, it can be, to think about the story behind the music and what you want your audience to feel when you play that piece, sharing your spirit and your soul through your instrument. And then it goes back to, as I said, our need to connect because it's very real. And music is such a beautiful and wonderful way for us to do it, right? Yes. Yes, that's that's so important. I think just um, because I I judge, you know, uh, uh, competitions uh, sometimes, and I uh, I see the number one problem I see really uh, uh, in in kids is that they play in such a I wouldn't I, I don't want to say robotic because you know they they obviously have feelings, but <laughs> exactly like what you said, they they don't really translate that into their playing so mm -hmm. i really think you know you you touch on really really important points and mm -hmm. i'm i'm glad that you said it to our mm -hmm. audience and and so that people know um we we only have you know you know five six minutes left but i would like sure. to ask you just a little more on you know to those people uh, you you talk, you mentioned about you know putting it into practice how does yeah. one practice <laughs> playing more expressively how does how, how does one are there tips and tricks uh in in you know a very short time five minutes can you talk <laughs> about that <laughs> sure absolutely no and i mean it's actually simple and i'll really talk about it more with the students that are going to play too but sure. um one thing i want to share this because i this was written by i found this article online and i want to read this his name is zach evans so i have to give him credit and i loved how he put this so i'm going to read this to you um when you convey happiness, right? The outside of your eyes squint slightly, the corners of your mouth raise and your lips pull back to reveal a smile, right? Things happen. You don't think about these small changes. They happen subconsciously, right? So the same goes for playing piano. He says, to make a single chord sound more sentimental, you might slightly slow down the tempo, relax your wrist, round your arms down and out when you play it. You don't have time to think about these movements. They have to come from your subconscious. To come from your subconscious, they must be triggered by an emotion. So I love the way that he put this, essentially saying that just like our brain, you know, we do things all the time. I'm moving my hands as I speak. We're not consciously thinking about this, right? But when you talk about being able, basically he's talking about the technique of playing, right? Technique is to serve expression. That's the point. So if your teacher is talking, okay, I want you to be sad here. Well, you know what? Without even being getting a technique lesson, many would already start to do with their body the thing that would create the sound. They would literally experiment, even if they were never told, to try to get that sound because we all know what it should feel like and what it should sound like. So I loved it. Technique serves the emotion. It should actually be spurred by that. So at any rate, then there's a technique you can use with this whole emotional state of visualization, okay? So before you play, you can visualize a scene that could relate to your music, okay? So let's say you wanna play a calm, serene, beautiful piece, and maybe you think about sitting next to a quiet lake or a fast piece, maybe you're in the middle of a war zone or something, maybe a video game that these kids are playing, you know? So at any rate, if this is one idea, think of a story or some, experience that puts you in that spot, okay? That's one. And then see what happens with your response, 
Okay, I'm looking at the time. Now, the next one is emotional extremes. Okay, so what this may be is you mentioned the word robot. So you could try this. Try just playing your piece or part of your piece like a robot, no emotion, which for many kids, they're already doing that. So just play it the way you already do it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. So then, then by contrast, play it just dripping with emotion, like so much emotion, like maybe more than you ever thought you should do. But here's the point. Can you hear the difference? That would give you a sense of how far the range can be, right? And then finally, recording yourself can really help. Okay. So let's say you've tried these things, the extreme emotion, the visualization, something you know, in another way, by the way, is to just sit down and get a piece of paper and just write down general emotions, right? There's so many, there's a big range. So whatever it is for you, whatever your age is, just whatever you can think of, write down emotions, like a whole list. And then just for fun, try to play your piece or etude or whatever uh, with each emotion. This is just to like basically open yourself up, okay? And so then recording yourself really is the final thing that can help because sometimes, and I do it too, I know we all do this as professionals, when we think we're doing something, right? But we record ourselves and listen back, oh, I was not doing what I thought. So after all this, record yourself and be your own judge. Like, did it sound, were you trying to be happy? Well, does it sound happy? Or is it sad, you know? And so these things can really help and I think will help basically open you up to share with others. And I want to finish with this little quote, which I thought was beautiful, from C.P.E. Bach, which is one of J.S. Bach's sons, one of his many children. <laughs> he wrote, a musician cannot move others unless he or she too is moved. And I believe this is so true because if we convey real emotions through our performances, our audience will feel it. And isn't that the point of what we do? That was such a great speech and that was such a great ending. I think, you know, <laughs> definitely feel it yourself, move, be moved, I yes. guess, by your own music. Yes. And then you can move others. Yes. I think that's, that's, that's a great point to take home. And that's a great point to move on to our next uh, section, great. which is the masterclass, one-on-one -on -one masterclass great. section. But thank you so much for sharing us, sure. sharing with us uh, uh, those points. I think you know that's yes. very, very important for young pianists to know. Uh, and we do have a, uh, a, a a audience question actually, but okay. you can you, you can choose to you know answer that later or now. But I will just read it to you right now. Sure. Um, our audience, um, Michelle, his, her name is also Michelle, um, wanted to know how you learn to play sacred music because it's so different because you have to learn to improvise. So she was wondering about that. Uh, if you need some time to think about that, we can go to the lesson first or you, if, or you can talk about it well, right I now. I can just answer you... it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a great question. And I, I didn't touch on that too much, but um, I did, in my case, grow up Christian. And so going, um, and I'm still Christian, sorry, but having grown up in the church, I, from a young age, was playing um, in the service. Like I might play a little special music song, but then eventually, and this is again, teenage years, I was even playing, sometimes subbing and playing the hymns in church, right? So basically from that age, I was already experimenting with the improvis improvisation that she's asking about. In other words, Words where when I would play hymns, I would add arpeggio, you know, arpeggios and extra chords and things to fill out the hymn. I was already experimenting with that when I was young. And it started out quite simple. I had to even practice it. It wasn't just on the spot. But then after a while, I became more comfortable with that. So what I would recommend for anyone that's asking that question, even if they want to play sacred music and they're not in the church all the time, the main thing is that you need to basically practice by, I would always say, I would actually say get a hymn book, right? I'll just start with that. Reading through hymns and just practice simple additions where it may be one, adding arpeggiations, adding octaves, and then big one, modulation. 
So practice taking a hymn and modulating to another key. The more comfortable you get to being able to change keys on the same song, the easier it is to basically improvise on a hymn or sacred piece more. So hopefully that helps. Great, great. All right, um, that's a great answer, and I hope that answers your question, our audience, Michelle. Um, so uh, our first performer of the night, we have two tonight, and our first performer of the night uh, is Daniel, and uh, I believe he's um, seven or eight. Uh, I think it's, he's seven years old. Anyways, I will put him in, and we'll set up the, the lesson. And what is Brian playing again? Uh, uh, Daniel. That's his, his name is Daniel, oh, and no, he's sorry. playing. Daniel, you're mine. Sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, he is playing um, Bugmuller's uh, Pastoral, which is That's the right. A2 Opus 100 number three, and uh, Cherney A2 Opus 599 uh, number course, 20. Great. Wonderful. So, let's um, get his video up. Oh, great! Great. There's Daniel. All right, so this portion, I'll leave it up to you, Michelle, and I'll turn off my video, and I'll be assisting you when you need me. I'll be here. When will I know that it's over almost? I mean, I guess I can look at my clock. Uh, you, you, you could, and I'll, I'll definitely remind you if you go over. Okay, sounds <laughs> All right, good. All so great. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Great. Um, which, which piece are you going to start with for us? Which one? Charney. Charney. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I look forward to hearing it and you can go on ahead. What I'm going to do is have you play both songs for me, and then we're going to talk about each. So you can go now to the Bergmuller, please. Wonderful job. Okay, so let's actually, we're gonna go backwards and talk about um, the two pieces you did. So we're gonna talk about the Bergmuller first, okay? The Pastoral. So Daniel, I wanted to ask you, um, have you ever performed this piece before, the Pastoral? Have you ever played it in front of anyone before? No, oh, it's really great then. It's always a little scary to play for our first time in front of people, but I didn't get that sense from you. You seemed like you were very comfortable and confident playing it. So first of all, bravo on that for your first performance to be so good, okay? So um, I actually wanted to ask you, and you might not really know, do you know what why it's called the pastoral or what a pastoral is? Like a 
It's like a what? Say it again. A field? Yes. Oh, so you do know a little bit about it. Okay. And so you were actually right on the, you're on the right track right there. So a pastoral is actually um, basically evoking like, pasture or countryside or sort of the old country life. You know what I mean? That kind of um, feeling. And I'm glad that you already know that. That's actually really good. And so there's something about the way that a pastoral should feel that's kind of laid back and, you know, kind of easy. And I love, you know what, the background behind you on the piano, I feel like it's perfect for this. I see the trees in the background there, which are really nice. And it kind of feels like you're there with right now, just with, <laughs> with the trees. So this feeling that's a little bit almost, I guess, easy going and a little, maybe even you're kind of peaceful you know, with a pastoral, if you think about yourself in this place, right, and in this setting. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about was, to some degree, if we could feel a little bit more peaceful in how we play this. Okay, so what, how do we do that? Okay, well, one of the things is your left hand is interesting, right? Because the left hand has these repeated chords. Now, I might just sort of lean back because I don't want to move my mic too much. So hearing these chords. Now, when I play it like that, I don't feel very peaceful. I don't really feel like I'm at peace here. Do you feel peaceful when I play that? <laughs> no. And so that element, if we don't do it correctly, it can break that sense of peace and calm. But what about this? Do you feel peaceful when I play this? Do you feel peaceful when I play that? Yeah, that's where it is. I think the actual melody in the right hand gives a beautiful sense of peace. I could even see um, someone walking in this, this pasture, or maybe um, through the forest and singing the this melody, or maybe they're playing it on a flute or something. I have a picture in my mind that makes me think of this setting. And when the person is singing or playing their instrument, they're very calm and it's very peaceful. And so I think Bernmuller did a great job because the melody gives us that. But this does not, okay? So here's the thing. There's right hand and left hand. We have to do both of those parts. So how, I wanna ask you, Daniel, how could we make those parts both sound peaceful? What could we do so that it can sound a little bit more peaceful and, it, and we can make it work together? What would you do? Um, can you come closer to the mic? I just can't hear you or closer to your uh, your screen as you talk. Play quieter. Ah, play quieter. Well, I'm going to push you. Um, what exactly should we play quieter? Ah, very good. The chord, you're very smart. So you already know a lot of these things. Correct. Because if the left hand chords are taking away the sense of piece of our pastoral, but the right hand melody does not, then how we do our left hand will already make a difference. So being as light as we can with those repeated chords will make a huge difference, right? So that's one. Before we do that though, can you play the right hand alone for me? And I want you to pretend that you're walking through this forest, maybe the forest in the background. Here, turn around and look behind you. Look at these trees, okay? I want you to imagine that you're in this beautiful forest. I love this background. And that you are playing or singing this right hand melody and that you are feeling very peaceful and very happy, okay? Can you try that? Just your right hand for me, please.
Okay, you can stop there. That was that was very beautiful. That made me feel like I was in the forest with you. So now I want you to put the hands back together. But I want you to remember what it sounded like just now when you play your right hand so beautifully and your left hand. I don't want it to get in the way. Have it just be very calm sound in the background. And the closer you stay to the keys, the easier it is. If you keep your fingers very close to the keys, it's easier to be softer. So I want you to keep that left hand in the background and make sure the right hand's just a little bit louder, but still peaceful. Go ahead and try it. Beautiful, Daniel. That was so much better. And I'm sure the audience could hear that. That made me feel like I was much more at peace. Now, the only little thing I would say is when you finish the first half, I wouldn't get faster. You have a really good tempo here. So when you're doing this part, I'll just show you. And you can get softer at the end end of the phrase. So keep it steady. One, two, three, four. Not any faster. Very steady. Very little ting. Okay. Um, can you try it just one more time for me? And remember that at the end of the first half. Beautiful, you can keep going. Now the left hand, again, has a little bit, it's a little different, but it's not that much different. The left hand is still supporting the right hand, okay? So keep going. Okay, great. So I wanted to say something. Now, in this little part that you just played, I feel like I turned a corner, maybe, in the forest. I went to some other, or the pasture, whatever you're imagining right now. But I went somewhere else, and the scenery changed a little bit. And maybe, for a moment, I was a little bit worried for a moment. I'll tell you why. Now, actually, I want you to tell me. There's this part from where you started, from here. From there until where you just stopped. There's like two measures in there where I felt like maybe I was a little nervous. I want to see, can you tell? Play, play for me where you think I'm talking about. It's somewhere in between where I, where I just started and where you stopped. Where do you think maybe I could have gotten a little nervous? Where does it feel like the music might have changed to slightly nervous? Ah, you are so good. That's exactly what I was thinking. I can't, I'm so impressed. And you're seven years old? You're so young. I'm so impressed that you're already thinking about this. Wow. So that's exactly right right there because you know what we get these flats we didn't have any flats before right we were in g major we're just in g major that's a happy key right but for a moment we get these flats and it seems like it's going to go a little bit to the minor but it doesn't stay there but it does right there so since you knew that that was a spot i want you to show me more that you're a little nervous there I want to feel that for two measures. I'm a little bit nervous. But then right after that, we come back to the melody we had at the beginning, right? And we're happy again. We're calm again. 
so you can show me that you're a little nervous and now you're calm. Can you do that for me? Okay, start from here. So you can get into it. Thank you, Daniel. That I could definitely tell the difference. I definitely saw that you did a little extra in that part to make it seem a little bit like we're nervous, okay? But the only thing is when you get back to the theme, don't forget to keep that left hand a little quieter because I didn't feel as calm as I did at the beginning when you got back to that melody. So remember to bring that left hand back down, okay, into the end. And um, another little idea. Sometimes when we are coming back to a melody that we played before, it can help to sort of set it up a little bit. And what I mean by set it up is we could kind of maybe slow down just a little bit back to before we get to the main um, melody. And it just helps the listener to calm down again because we were a little nervous before, but now we're not. I'll show you what I mean. So here, In the last two, the last two D's there, I took a little extra time, a little retard, just before the melody came back, okay? Can you try that for me? You can start from the second half, the same spot before. From there. I could just say, okay, we're done. But there's something, at least in my music that I'm looking at. So you tell me if we have the same thing. In the second to last measure, there are some words there. Do you have some words in the second to last measure? Does it say anything? Oh, thank you for sharing it on the screen. It says it here. Yeah, what does that say? Well, Oh, I, do you know what that says or what it means? Dim and poco rollentondo. Do you know what that means? Okay, so there's two different things it's telling you to do there. The first, the dim is short for diminuendo. And that word means to get softer, okay? And the second part, the poco Rawl, which is short for raw and tondo, poco raw, means, uh, poco means little, so just a little, and raw and tondo essentially means to slow down, you know, so it's to slow down a little bit. So Berg Mueller has asked that anyone playing this piece has to get softer and slower into the end, which I didn't feel like you did. So it should be definitely more like this. Ah, you see, I took time in that last measure and I got softer. Okay, so can you try that for me? Because that's really important. How about we go from four measures from the end, which would be right here. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yes, that's the idea, Daniel, because right there, this is such a wonderful way to end our pastoral. 
which started very calm and should end very calm. And that's the way to do it when we get softer and slower, okay? So I know people are watching you, you can't see them, but we're all gonna give you a hand from afar. Yeah, you can hear it from Brian, because first of all, that was really impressive. We're not done yet, but I do wanna say that I am very impressed at, at for such a young age, Daniel, at seven years old, that you already have some ideas about what the music is telling you. So what I want you to do is to take this with you. When you're learning a song, whatever it may be, always ask yourself, well, what is the music trying to tell me? Am I supposed to be happy? Should I be scared? Should I be, um, should I be um, angry? Should I be, well, what should I be? And sometimes we won't know until we start to play it. And once we start to play it, we usually can figure it out. And you already knew a lot. So when you ask yourself this, the next question is, am I happy the entire song? Maybe not. We just found a part in the song, which you found for me, that felt a little bit nervous. So there was a moment that wasn't quite the same. So music is like this. Music is a journey. It's a story or a journey. And if you read a storybook, sometimes it's, the story may start out really happy. And then sometimes the, the characters in the story might get scared or be mad or whatever they may be. And that's normal, right? And so music is also a story. It doesn't always feel the same the whole time. And if the music doesn't feel the same, then we shouldn't feel the same. So even at your age, you can do, because you just did it for me, you can think about these things and it makes it sound so much better. So thank you so much for um, working with me. So let's go to your journey, which I don't have as much to, to talk about. I wanted to talk more about the um, Bergmuller. Okay. Um, the journey, I'll say, to me, I think it has one, maybe one emotion. I don't think it changes too much with the emotion, but you tell me, Daniel, what do you feel like when you play the journey? What's the emotion that you feel? Happy. Say it a little louder. Happy. happy. I do too. It's a very happy etude. I definitely do. And actually, I did feel like you were pretty happy playing it, but um, I thought maybe you could have even a little bit more excitement while you play it with this. And, and, and the excitement could come from our tempo or our, our, our energy. And um, I don't wanna tell you exactly how to do it, but I want you to really think about what you just told me. Like if you're really happy, let's say um, it's your birthday and you're really excited about a gift you're gonna get that you might really want, right? And so you're pretty happy when you wake up on your birthday, aren't you? <laughs> I was. And so that feeling that you get when you wake up, you know, I want you to show me that in the journey even more. Okay. So, and then I have one other little thing to say about it, but can you play it for me again? And I want you to think that it's your birthday and you're just about to get the present that you always wanted. Okay. And please show me that. excited too. I thought about when, 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 how I felt when I was young and having a birthday. So I definitely felt a little bit more energy. And then the final thing I want to talk about is a little bit technical to some degree, because I was talking about this earlier that of course, 
our emotions and how we feel, I think actually are the most important because that's what makes it interesting for those who hear you. But it is also important to think about phrasing and dynamics and other stuff. Like those are our foundations. And without the foundation, then sometimes things can fall apart. So to speak on that, I just thought that maybe you could do a little bit more with dynamics and a little bit more with phrasing. I know that Sharni did not put dynamics in there, or at least not in the eight, the one I'm seeing. Yours might have it. But at any rate, when there is no dynamics written, or I should ask you, are there any dynamics in your etude? Does it say forte or piano or anything? No. So Sharni didn't write that. But even when a composer doesn't put any forte, piano, mezzo forte, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't exist. That means that it's up to us to be creative, okay? So with the little time I have to give some examples, most of the time when you have, let's talk about the right hand, when you have a melody that's the notes are going high, it's always a good idea to have a little bit of like a crescendo as you go up. This is just basic. It can actually get as we go higher, we may open up our sound. And when we go down the scale and the notes are going lower, we might diminish our sound just a little bit. And I'll show you what I mean in this measure right here. Here, as I go up, I might get a little louder. And on my way down, I might get a little softer, which is natural to how we would sing that phrase. So the higher notes, more, and then get softer. See? And then I'm going to keep going. I would do it here, too. I mean, and then there's other options, too. But at any rate, can you try that for me? This is um, from the one, two, three, four, the fifth measure. Start from measure five for measure five, please. And see if you can show me that. Just right hand, just right hand. That was wonderful, Daniel. That's the right idea. That's the right idea. Keep going now. One more little thing. In the second half, notice that the same melody happens twice. Bum, bum, ba, dum, ba, da, 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 then we do it again. Bum, bum, ba, da, 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 da. In music, if you do the same thing twice, you usually don't want to play it the same way. It gets boring pretty fast. So therefore, maybe the first time you could be forte. Bum, ba, da, da, ba, da, 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 da. And the second time be piano. Bum, bum, ba, da, to make an echo kind of thing. This contrast makes it more interesting. Can you try that? Go ahead and try that from the second half. Right, so just that's one idea. And then you could go back to being louder right after that, okay? So let's end it off with you playing with your left hand. And remember left hand, definitely not the melody. Keep that left hand light. And see if you can show me this stuff we just talked about with these crescendo and decrescendos, okay? So don't do the repeat though. Please don't repeat it. Just go from the beginning to end. Oh, both hands, honey, both hands. so much better and much more interesting okay so daniel that's um the end of our time i want to say thank you so much for not only playing so well but even more importantly being such a great listener and really reacting and doing what i was asking you to do 
do. That can be hard to do at seven years old. I know because I have some students that age that it can sometimes be hard for them to really respond to some of the stuff I was saying, but you responded to all of it. So I know that your future is going to be great. Okay. So keep up the good work and thank you for playing for us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> great job, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. That was great. Let me... All right, so we have our next uh, performer ready in the waiting room. So I'll awesome. put him in. Uh, his name is Preston, uh, and he is 10 years old. He will be playing Chopin's Prelude, uh, Opus 28, number 6. I think I have that right. Yes, yep. number 6. <laughs> All right, so let me get him in. There we go. Oh, Preston, your video is. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. I think we can all go like this. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. Leave it up to you guys. Great. Thanks, Brian. Hi, Preston. How are you? I'm good. Awesome. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. And you can go ahead with the Chopin, please. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and the sound actually got a little better as you went along. Somewhere in the middle, I was able to hear all of your um, pitches being sustained. I'm not sure what changed, but that was perfect because it gave me an even better sense of what you were doing. Um, yes, overall, bravo. I think it was very sentimental, um, the way that you played this. So I'm going to start with I don't know if you heard my whole intro, but if you did, then you'll know where I'm going, <laughs> which is a question for you, which is, um, how does this piece make you feel? Or what do you think about when you play this piece? What emotion are you trying to express to us, the listeners? Um, this piece makes me feel like sad mm -hmm. because it's like slow and soft. Mm -hmm. So then it sounds like someone who's like crying and sad. Yeah, something. absolutely. No, I know what you mean. It definitely has um, a very sort of melancholy, you know, kind of uh, sort of depth to it. Another thing which is interesting is of course the fact that it's in B minor, right? which makes us, and that's also very interesting, right? Like, I'm sure you remember when you first were learning piano that you were probably asked, 
what's the difference between major and minor? And then what would your answer be? Um, like how it feels. Like usually one is a little bit um, like sad mm -hmm. and different. Well, major is always like nice and happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And so that's such a basic, but it's true, right? I mean, even when we're first learning piano, we're asked how it makes us feel. And that's how we remember. Think about that. Because when I first started, we didn't know all the theory behind major and minor chords. You might know it now, but when you first start, you probably don't know the theory behind it and exactly what interval it is, but you know that one always sounds a little bit brighter and happier and the other one sounds a little darker and sad, right? So if you ask a kid, which one, you know, and you probably did this, teacher plays the chord, right? And you say, oh, is it major or minor? And just because you feel some kind of way, you know the answer, right? without even looking. So it's so interesting because again, it shows us that the harmonies and the structure of a piece, all sorts of things, the tempo, right? You said that too, it's slow, feels sad. So in other words, all of these technical things actually translate to giving us a certain emotion. And so then the question is that once we figure out what that emotion is or what we want it to be, you know, then the question is, am I doing everything I can to bring that emotion to the listener, you know, or bring it out? Am I technically doing everything I can in order to bring that out? That's where I'm going to go with how we work on this piece, right? So in a lot of ways, the answer is that you have. I think you've done a lot already to show me that that's how you feel or how it feels. But I think you can take it farther, okay? So I'm going to start with tempo. So it says asai lento. What does lento mean? I forgot. Okay. <laughs> what do you think it means? Um, slower. Right. It's, <laughs> it's a form of very slow, correct? And actually, I want to give you the exact, in a moment, I'm going to give the exact definition because I don't even want to say it wrong. Um, on There's various forms of playing slowly, right? So if you look up in a music dictionary, it actually says slow tempo, but not as slow as Largo. Because that's one of the music dictionaries that I'm reading right now, right? And so somebody would say, well, what's Largo? <laughs> that's another form of slow, right? So there's so many different actually uh, terms that we may use. Adagio is another one, right? Thank you for showing to the audience the lento aside that I'm talking about. Um, exactly. So there's so many different words that can be used and they actually have a different um, level to them because uh, andante, do you know what andante means? Um, like, it's like a little well, then lento, right? It actually means walking tempo, right? So that the idea is how you would walk, sort of casually walk, that could give you a sense of the tempo, right? So a lot of people say andante means slow, but actually it's not that slow. And so lento is definitely slower than andante. Now, a sigh, do you know what a sigh means? No. Okay, it means much, very much. So that says something. Chopin didn't just say lento, which did mean basically slow, right? He said a sigh lento, which is very much lento, very much slow. Okay, now, do you feel that you were playing very much slow? No. <laughs> right, it could be a little slower, right? So, okay, again, this is relative. That's always the interesting part about interpreting scores. If Chopin was alive, which would be great, you and I could call him into our video masterclass right now. Wouldn't that be cool if I just be like, hey, Chopin, how's it going? Okay, we're trying to figure out exactly what tempo you wanted here. You know, that would be cool, right? But um, we can't. So we have to use clues. And to me, the fact that he put in a sigh is my clue. He could say lento, but he said a sigh. So he wanted you to really be slow. Okay, and so then what's too slow? How slow is too slow? There's definitely too slow, right? Like to me, um, um, to me, this would be too slow. 
Would you agree? <laughs> we might never get through the piece. Okay, so how could I figure out, huh? Maybe I'll ask you, how would I know what's too slow? Like what, what would be a clue that might help me find the right tempo? What would be like the main thing I might use to figure that out in the music? That might be a hard question, but what you might, what you might think. The metronome uh, that's true, but let's say we didn't have a metronome. Okay. So I'll just tell you. So we would use our voice. That's what we would use. Singing. See, the thing is that singing is the most natural instrument that you have. Okay. The piano, all the stuff I talked about, the seven instruments I play, the most natural is clearly our own voice, right? That's actually how so many things are figured out. So the way I would know how not to go too slow is that if I tried to sing as slow as I just tried to play it for you, I, it's, it's like a sentence that if I talk this slow, you would want to kill me like, oh my goodness, can you finish your sentence? It's the same idea. It's a phrase in music. We call it a phrase, but a phrase is a musical sentence. So how would we get from the beginning to the end of the phrase. We've got to use that. How would I sing this? And how slow can I sing it and still have it make sense? So for instance, I'll sing a little bit. That feels pretty good. Could I go slower? Uh, yeah. yeah, I could go that tempo and I feel like it still sounds like a phrase. Da, 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 da. That seems too slow because now I feel like I can't really get my sentence out. Do you see how I did that? I didn't use a metronome, but I tried sort of humming it and then I found something that seemed to fit. Okay, so why I'm talking about this so long is because this applies to everything in music with a melody. That if we start from a point of using our voice, now, do you like to sing or do you ever sing, even for yourself? I sometimes sing to myself. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. Because I hear students is like, I never sing. I'm horrible. And I have to sort of force them to do some, some way of expressing themselves. It's not about having a good voice. It's not even about doing it in front of people. But it is about being comfortable enough to try to vocalize the music because it gives you all the clues and all the answers you ever needed. It will show you how to make the phrase work. Okay. So I won't make you sing in front of everyone on the camera right now, if you don't want to, unless you want to, <laughs> that's what I thought. So I, it's okay, but I want you to think about that. So we're going to do your left hand alone. Chopin said a sigh lento, very much slow. So we know that now, but I don't want you to play yet. I want you to sing it with all the emotion you can in your head. I won't make you do it out loud, but visualize yourself singing this and give me what you feel like that tempo would be with just your left hand. Okay, so Preston, I like that, but didn't convince me. It didn't convince me that you were really a silento. It also didn't convince me that you were all that sad. Can you try again? And give yourself about 30, like 15 seconds. Don't just play. Like really close your eyes. Close your eyes and like hear it in your head first. Okay, Preston, so I'll tell you what, I did feel like it was a little bit sadder. You didn't really change the tempo, 
But here's the thing, maybe that's okay because I would experiment with that. I'm not really the judge. Chopin is not here to tell you exactly what tempo you should do. Okay, as a teacher, I might say, no, 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 it's too fast, play slower. I might play it slower, who knows? Does that make it right? I don't know. Really, I don't, right? There's no metronome marking there. There is no exact answer. So I wanna say that I would leave you alone to some extent, even if I might do it a little slower than you. You know what? That's not such a big deal to me. What matters though, is that you feel that you are expressing the sadness and the real, as best as you can, that quality as you're playing this, even if you stick with that tempo. Okay, so remember that. There's not always absolutes in music. So we're gonna leave that where it is. That was much better. Okay, the right hand. What does sotto voce mean? Do you know? Okay, so sotto, vo sotto voce, which is written right there in the music um, in the first, uh, great, thank you, which is written right in the music, right in the first um, measure, okay? It means under voice, okay? It's like, well, what does that really mean? Okay, to some extent, it's like, in some senses, muted. You know, you could look at it that way. Um, so it's referring in some ways to the quality of this melody and also in some ways of course to the right hand but it's basically um in the sense that the right hand is definitely in the background okay our left hand is the melody here so it's going to have to be a little bit more heard and it's also giving us a sense of this sort of hushed quality right that the right hand is going to need to have compared to the left hand and even that affects the left hand because again this is a sad darker piece so you did a pretty good job. Um, I actually was impressed a lot of the time with your right hand, but there were times where I forgot that the real thing we need to hear is that left hand. Now, what instrument would you, let's say you were gonna give an instrument to the left hand. What instrument would you give the left hand to play this solo? Other than the piano. Ah. I like the way you think. That's exactly what I feel like Chopin was probably thinking about. Can't prove it, but that's definitely what I feel, that the cello would play this so well, you know, and just really enjoy it with vibrato and everything. And then maybe the cello, the cellist is the soloist in front of a group, an orchestra or chamber group, and then the strings in the background are doing the right hand, very hushed so that we can hear the cello. So I want your left hand to be the cello soloist and, and for your right hand to be the basically the accompaniment of the orchestra that is hushed and supportive, okay? I want you to really show me that. And finally, before you play it again, I want you to be this cello soloist in your left hand that feels incredibly sad about You know what? Here's a real emotion. We all wish that we could probably be with our friends and right now we all need to be safe and stay home right and so that kind of makes me sad sometimes and that's going on right now so maybe even that could be your emotion but you can make it your own but make your left hand a separate person that's feeling something like this and your right hand is just the orchestra just supporting okay all right close your eyes again 15 seconds i want you to hear it and then i want you to play
Okay, Preston, you can stop. Beautiful. Beautiful. In a lot of ways, I feel it much more from you. Okay. But then I want to mention this. I was talking about this with um, Daniel from earlier. And thinking about the fact that often, we did say this, I said to Daniel, very often pieces don't just have one emotion the entire time. Right? Because music is a story and most stories go different directions. So keeping that in mind, I felt that at some point in some of the stuff you were playing, um, I felt like the emotion turned a little bit. Maybe it was a little bit positive, maybe a little hopeful. Can you show me where that is in the music? Where would you say that maybe it took a turn into something optimistic? I measure 11. I have to count. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ah, I like, you know what, Brian? I don't know. You picked some really good people for this master class. <laughs> you know, it's it's them. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> because I, it, I'm telling the audience, I didn't plan this. I didn't ask them this ahead of time. It just makes it beautiful because I love the way that you are thinking, Preston. Um, so um, trying to see if I can. Can we spotlight Preston's video again? I'm seeing, there we go, thank you. So Preston, um, uh, you are absolutely right. And I'm glad that you noticed that. Right there, it takes this hopeful turn. Why do you think harmonically it feels more hopeful? Yeah. What happened in the music? Uh, it switches keys. Ah, it switches to what though? C major. Ah, very good. Look, he knows his theory. Exactly. And then we get C major for those next uh, couple measures, two measures at least. Right? So that's kind of huge. If we've been playing B minor, and it's been pretty depressing, and then we get to C major, that's a huge difference from B minor. I would love to feel that more from you. That change I could, and then it goes back right where I stopped you to minor. Okay, I'm gonna get technical with you. Now, of course, yes, we said major, minor, fine. Okay, that's obvious. But I'm getting technical in the sense that, what's the word rubato mean? When someone says, use rubato, what are they talking about? Robotic? <laughs> no. <laughs> Although, I don't want you to do that. <laughs> so I'll spell it. Rubato, R-U-B-A-T-O. Rubato, rubato. Have you heard that word before? No. Okay, so rubato is a very important word when it comes to Chopin's music. I can tell you that. It is essentially the push and pull of the music. I'm going to put it that way. In other words, it's the bending, the bendability of a song where you can, I think, let the music push forward a little bit and pull back and get a little slower and finding a balance to do that. Rubato is interesting because it's often not written in the music. It doesn't say accelerando and retard. In other words, it's not written technically like that. It's something that is natural to a phrase. Even if I'm speaking in a sentence, as you noticed, I kind of talk fast. I might start talking faster and I might slow down to put emphasis on a certain word like I just did. That's normal. And if we speak like this, which is like a robot, we kind of lose a lot of our, you know, uh, our expression and uh, our power. So in music, it's the same. It's finding a natural push and pull. So you can actually help us, and I'll demonstrate, with this major change to C major or whatever it is, and then transition back to minor. Roboto is huge in making it more effective, okay? So for instance, if I go, um, as I move into the major section, I might be a little more excited and I might push a little bit. So I'll get into it. So here's the minor right before that. to 
So do you see what I did there? And even within my left hand, it just wasn't always steady. But here's the thing, Preston, you're already using bravado. You were doing that earlier. You had times where I felt that you got a little faster and slower, either because your teacher told you to, or maybe because you naturally felt that way. You were doing it. But now you know what this word really means. And I, you can see by how I did it that you could do it much more. And how effective is that? Now I can show you, oh, I'm happy with this major section. And then I give the listener time. We need that. We need a ch chance to calm into calm down in a way into the transition back to sad. You know, if I'm happy and then I'm sad and then I'm happy and I'm sad, people think I'm crazy, right? I need, you know, there's some kind of a transition from the excitement and then maybe I'm not so excited anymore. You know, so either, either way, did you notice there was a transition from that emotion? And if I immediately do it sometimes, it's not as effective. Now, again, it depends. There's never absolute. Sometimes in music, you might want to surprise people with a new emotion, but a lot of the time setting it up is better. Okay. So can you go from that spot for me, which is two measures before it turns major and then give me push into the major a little bit and then slow down. Show me that the minor is back. Go ahead. And that was just, that was gold right there. That was absolute gold. I mean, that change that you just made, I could feel it. I could really feel it. And you may have thought you were doing it before, but because you didn't use rubato to help you, it wasn't as effective, but that was very effective. You see, oh my goodness, that was absolutely beautiful. And then I want you to, cause we're almost at the end. So I'm gonna have you go to the end from this spot. And the last thing I wanna say to you is, and you did this a little bit. You see how Chopin says in the last line, it says pianissimo and then the very last like two beats, it's triple P, three P's. Okay, what does pianissimo mean for those that might be watching that don't know, it means very soft. Two P's, they put two letter P's next to each other. It means very soft. If they put three letter P's together, it's basically like as soft as possible, but it actually usually is indicative of an emotion like fading away, fading completely away. You did that quite well. It's very hard to control your fingers there, but I want you to show me this in your rubato. So in other words, Give me maybe more of a retard at the end, not just with getting softer, but the feeling that you are dying away, that you're just tired and maybe you're gonna go to sleep. But somehow I feel that tempo and that shift, okay, at the end. All right, so let's go from, gosh, you did that so well, I wanna hear it again. Let's go from the same spot right before the major and then go to the end and show me that.
Wow, beautiful, wonderful. And your hand from everyone watching you, you deserve it. Oh, that gave me some chills. It really was quite beautiful, Preston. And I would, as I said, I would just take what you're doing with this prelude, you can take it even further, you know, in, into your own thoughts and your own emotions and what I'm saying and using Roboto in creative ways in this piece yourself, but also into any other music that you're playing, especially by Chopin. Chopin, all of his music is full of these kind of ideas. So, and I can tell by your sound, you have a beautiful sound. You have a lot of great qualities already for 10 years old. So keep it up. And I can't wait to see just how expressive you are, even as you grow and in and, and age and in wisdom. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Preston. Great job. Bravo. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, with that great performance, I think tonight's episode will come to an end. <laughs> Michelle, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to thank you again for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. It was really inspiring for me to hear these young kids uh, who really are doing wonderful things. Even everyone's stuck at home, but it's always great to see that, you know, great things are happening <laughs> all exactly. over the world. <laughs> exactly. And their performances inspire me every week as well. Oh, that's so good. Um, for those of you who are watching, if you want to learn more about Michelle, go to her website at Michelle Ken. Uh, dot com. That, that's her full you name. Can, you can also follow me on Facebook. I have a fan page, Michelle Can Pianist. There so you go. Follow me and send me a message. If you like this, or you had any other questions, please send me a message through my fan page. Or as Brian mentioned, my website, there is a contact form and that will go straight to me. So definitely send me any questions or any thoughts that you may have. And I would love to hear from you. Thanks that again, is, Brian. That's so nice of you, Michelle. Sure. Thank you. All right. And I'd just like to remind our audience, the Piano Star Masterclass happens every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. And if you want to be a performing student, you can go to our website uh, at thepianoleague.com slash masterclass. Last but not least, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more piano content. And with that, we finished today's episode. Piano Leaguers, thank you for watching. Stay safe. Happy practicing. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>